All right, welcome to Talk Jiu-Jitsu with host Uki, Mike, Joey Bresky, and me, Jordan Bressinger from Jordan Teaches Jiu-Jitsu. We have a great episode for you guys today, like always, and uh, let's just get started with uh, the how the trip went. So I went to Trinidad and Tobago for a Jiu-Jitsu retreat, and it was super awesome. Like, um, yeah, I just had like the best time, even though one thing that really sucked was I got food poisoning, um, or the, I guess that's what it is. Like, uh, I got sick and, uh, it was pretty rough. The first couple, the first day was awful. Like I was just in bed the whole time and it was supposed to be the, the, like the meet and greet open mat. And I couldn't go because there was a zero chance of me getting out of bed. And, uh, so I spent a full day in bed that sucked. Then the next day, um, I taught, but I was like super out of it. Um, I can't even remember that day. I told him after like hopefully I taught a good class because yeah I was just like not in it mentally like um like I was in it in the sense of I was doing my best but like my mind was not working and um yeah I just tried my best to uh roll even though I was severely compromised and then the last day uh that's when I got the most rolling done so I rolled like the last day I rolled like 25 rounds between the morning session and the night session because I felt like I need to uh, make up for lost time. I felt really bad, you know, all these people spending, you know, good money, hard earned money. And uh, I know they want to roll with me and it would be so crappy for them to not get to. So that, yeah, that last day I just took one for the team, you know, just uh, went out with a bang. And the next day I was pretty tired to, from that. So yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing though. Like honestly, like the best part of the trip because everyone, you know, everyone has great training. We had great training, but um there were just so many free included excursions. It, we went to so many beaches, did so many cool things. And um, yeah, like the other organizer, cause it was me, it's me and another organizer that put it together um, who lives in Trinidad. And uh, he just like knocked it out of the park with, with the organization and putting, um, just making a great time for everyone. And um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. I got to roll, you know, Tyler Spangler and uh, you know, a bunch of fans. I didn't get to roll Jedi, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it was fun got a good tan but i got some sun damage i don't know if you guys noticed like my freaking forehead is like um i don't know it's like all brown and stuff sun spots kind of yeah yeah so i gotta get that figured out because i really rather not have um that you know <laughs> but um yeah we're already planning next year and uh it's gonna be even better because you know we learned from the small things we could have done better here and there um yeah but next year's gonna be amazing and i'm bringing um patrina who films all the all the all the roles and she's my assistant instructor i'm bringing her out uh giving her a little bonus of like you know just paying for it and and uh just gonna have a great time same with uh my employee Fage, Fage, who works for um me on the youtube channel and uh he also edits this podcast i'm also bringing him out again same thing like he works super hard same with patrina so um, i want them to experience trinidad and tobago and uh yeah i'm excited to do that for them yeah like uh did you guys see like any of the footage or do you guys uh keep up with like the instagram reels at all or like, posts and stuff like that i saw the role with the judoka and he looked like a pretty big boy yeah, yeah. he was man he was big and beastly and i w i did that role um pretty compromised like that was like my last day of um like feeling like total shit. like that was that night i could finally eat that night but um it was uh yeah, it was tough to do that role because I don't know if you saw. Okay, could you see in the video how like sunken in my face was? Yeah, you looked like. Would you say you lost like ten pounds or something like that? Well, I didn't get to uh, you know measure like uh, I didn't get to go on a scale, but when I came home, I was five pounds lighter. So I only assume I must have been ten pounds or or even more lighter when I did that role. So it was kind of just like survival almost just like I had to be very cautious of what I did. I used too much energy and uh, play smart. You know, like when I found out there was an Olympic judoka there, I'm like, wow, this is going to get a lot of views on YouTube, you know, so I got to get a role with him. And, uh, you know, he was super willing to do it, too. He was, he was a super nice guy. Um, and uh, but yeah, you know, next year when I go back, I want to do a pure judo round with him, which I don't think is going to go well for me. But, uh, you know, it's fun and it'll make great content. I wish I could have done that with him. Uh, but I, there's no way I could roll more and, and, you know, roll like actually good uh, at that point. But yeah, he, he was a beast for sure. Um, but you know, for me, like I, when I found out he was an Olympic judoka, I was like, I'm going to roll with him in the gi and I'm not going to pull guard because you know, that'd be pretty lame. So, cause we could have done no gi, right. But it, 
I want to, I want to feel that judo and, uh, yeah, yeah, good judo for sure. And, but I was lucky to, um, take like, yeah, take advantage of opportunity when he lifted up his leg and then went for a single and, uh, yeah, I was really happy to get to get him down because I was thinking, how am I going to get this guy down? But no, it was it was it was, uh, it was a good role for sure. I got to roll with the MMA fighter who's uh, like thirteen and one, so that's going to be the next YouTube video. And yeah, he was super strong and just super athletic. Like, um, yeah. When it comes to the judoka, how much uh, is it called nuaza? Is that when they go to the ground? How much of that do they actually train? Like, would a, a black belt in judo? immediately equal a blue belt in jiu-jitsu or how does that translate yeah so like some some judokas do a lot of nuaza but um like the current rule set is kind of set up where it doesn't really make sense to uh prioritize training of nuaza and and for those that don't know what nuaza is that's just the, the groundwork of um uh, of judo so they do do some uh grappling on the ground but in judo there's a, there's a limited time frame of how long you can be on the ground so it's very like you know you have to work hard right now to get it done. You can't like, you know, relax in your guard and, and do things because you also run the risk of getting pinned because if your back goes uh, flat on the mat, you know, you get pinned, same as wrestling. So, um, yeah, you know, I would say like probably most ju judoka is probably equal to a blue belt on the ground, but then obviously on stand up, it's they're they're elite at that. Oh, for sure. But, um, yeah, you know, it was one thing, it was pretty interesting, you know, watching his, uh, like breaking down his technique on the ground because, you know, he, um, he, and like I said in the video, he's taking a lot of outside position, trying to like roll me over and stuff like that, like, uh, like reverse me using, um, you know, just like outside position instead of inside position. But, you know, the problem with that is if when you're like gripping on the outside and side control, you can't really use your legs to help you get the sweep, right? Well, it's not a sweep at that point, it's a reversal, but you can't use your legs to, to really help you. So, you're really relying on your arms only. And uh, because there was a huge size advantage uh, for him or size difference, um, you know, it, it, that's that can be an effective strategy. But like I said in the video, I think you'd have a lot more success, more like traditional like um, grips, like underhooks and stuff like that. So yeah, that, that was pretty interesting. Did, uh, did you watch the role, Joey? No, I haven't seen it yet. I've been uh, unfortunately a little busy this week, but I plan on checking it out this afternoon. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it's done great on YouTube already. It's um, it already has like thirty five thousand views, and it's only it's not even been up twenty four hours. Wow. So yeah, I knew that one would just kill it. So even though you know I didn't get as much content as I wanted from Trinidad uh, and, and Tobago, um, I still got like quality content. Like I know I knew that video would do really well, and I think the video with the MMA fighter will do decent um, in terms of views. But I think the role itself is like uh, really entertaining and. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, you know, like, uh, yeah, because he's so strong. So uh, you ended up rolling with Tyler Spangler, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I rolled with Tyler. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good roll for sure. Um, one thing that surprised me is that it's, he's actually pretty strong and uh, big because I didn't realize he had gained so much weight because I asked him, you know, how, how big were you when you uh, started the YouTube channel? And he said about, about 140, and um, now he's about... Uh, he said 170. I think he's a little yeah, heavier than I that. I thought he looked about a buck 80. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think he's about like 175, 180. Um, maybe he hasn't, uh, has met, weighed himself in a while, but no, the strength definitely surprised me. Um, but yeah, we definitely had a, a good role. I wish we could have filmed it because pretty entertaining. Some nice, uh, techniques, uh, you know, happened. Um, but yeah, like that was the first, that was the first day before I realized I was sick and I was rolling. I rolled only three rounds. I'm, I was like dying. I was like, why am I so dead right now? Like, um, it was really baffling to me. I'm like, maybe I was out in the sun too much or not. Uh, yeah, maybe that, that's why I figured it was. But then, <laughs> then the night comes around and, uh, then sleeping was awful. And I, I really realized, okay, I'm like, I'm like pretty sick right now. So it all made sense because you know, normally I can roll like nonstop, but uh, yeah, it was really cool to roll with him, meet him and uh, yeah, and spend time with Jedi too. And yeah, Jedi is more of like a night owl. So like, uh, you know, I didn't really get to spend too much time with him just because he was out more at night and hanging out with everyone where, I, you know, I'm not really like, um, not like a partier, like drinker, not that he was like drinking or anything, like all the time or anything like that, but you know, some people had some drinks and stuff like that staying up late like obviously you're on vacation um but yeah i don't i don't really drink at all so yeah you know um next time i'd spend more time with them for sure they suck being sick he he filmed a like a white belt challenge video and uh so i'm looking forward to seeing that and uh 
yeah, you know, we're already planning next year. It's going to be super sick. And we're also, uh, we're planning a U a U.S. camp. So, um, yeah, I don't want to give too many details away to the audience, but, um, I'll tell you guys all about it after, but, um, no, it's probably going to be in Florida. What we're trying to do is, uh, get like a children's like, um, camp, uh, like a campsite where it has cabins and stuff like that, like on a lake. Um, and it's funny, my first question is like, okay, well, will there be like alligators there? But, um, th then I started thinking, well, if it's like a children's, like, uh, you know, campsite with a lake, I doubt there's going to be alligators there. So they probably have that under control. Yeah, I think we'll be all right. <laughs> that was my first, first concern for sure. But, um, yeah, I'm bring I'm trying to bring in like the top YouTubers, uh, Jiu-Jitsu YouTubers, because I think that like I think that it'll sell out because people were so stoked for uh, Tobago. We got 40 people and it is a bit of a trek, you know, for some people, not for, not for us that live close to Toronto because it's a direct flight, which is pretty sweet. Um, direct flight to Trinidad. And then you go to Tobago after that, which is like a 20 minute uh, flight. Um, but some people, man, they had a rough go of, uh, of traveling, had to travel here, then there, then there, and then to just to get here, to get there. But no, the U S camp, like, uh, flying to Florida is like super cheap. It's actually shocking. Like, um, I've seen some flights for like $150, uh, Canadian to Florida. And it's like, holy shit. Like how yeah. did they even make money <laughs> doing that? But, um, and it's a short flight too. So yeah, I'll have more info for people there. And, uh, yeah, I don't want to keep talking about myself, but we'll move on to your, you guys too soon. But another cool thing is I'm doing the ultimate self-defense, uh, challenge uh, championship. Joey, have you seen that, uh, that on YouTube, like Rokas, uh, martial arts journey, he put that on Jeff Chan was on and a bunch of other dudes. I, I had never even heard of it until oh, no? you like shared it. It's right? crazy, dude. It's like people Checked beating the, the shit out of each other on a bus. Yeah, so like there's like knife self-defense situations, there's like bus fights and all these other fights and I am confident I'll do well. Like, you know, I'm my plan is to win. I'm not just going to, you know, I'm not here to take over. I'm here no, I'm not here to, to participate. I'm here to take over. I, yeah, that's my mindset, you know, that like I want to win. So, you know, I'm going to leave every stone on uh I'm not gonna leave any stone unturned. So like, I'm going to uh, work on my conditioning, work on my strength because right now I'm pretty small. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't lifted for like a whole year, basically. I got so busy and I lost a lot of strength and muscle and um, I'm, I'm gonna gain that back. And I'm gonna work on my cardio. And I'm also going to just like simulate some like knife fights type of stuff. So I don't wanna go in there like never having someone try to stab me, you know, yeah. because no one's ever tried to stab me. Well, if you ever wanna work on that, I will gladly try to stab you. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> we'll send to get a, yeah, a knife that doesn't kill me. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's cool because like, I think it's a really good list of participants. Like uh, there's a, uh, a uh, pro basketball player uh, who's like 250 pounds, super tall, super athletic. And I think that he's going to be the wild card, like the toughest test actually, because he has the size and, and all that. Right. But also like the unpredictability. So uh, yeah, I think that it might be a little challenging to kind of like time is like, uh, and feel what he's going to do almost. So I think that one, that he might be pretty tough. There's also a UFC fighter. Um, I don't, even, I don't know if you've heard of Nathan Levy. He's a lightweight uh, from Israel. Have you heard, I, I haven't. He should he should be pretty good too. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just looking forward to it, you know, and because the goal is to get season three on Netflix or something like uh, some sort of platform like that. Yeah. So I feel like if I win, uh, it'll make a good case for me to come back for season three. And um, yeah, I plan on winning. So you know, like Jeff Chan won uh, the first one, and. Um, you know, I sparred with them before and, you know, I, I had a big size advantage. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it'll go well for me. And, um, but there's some, there is some cons about it in the sense that like I'm doing, um, a camp with, with Jeff, uh, in Vietnam in, uh, like right beforehand. And then there's a week break between that and the self-defense challenge. So, I'm just going to go to Thailand and hang out there for a week and train. And, uh, I love Thailand, so I can't wait to go back. But the problem is it's that I'm going to be gone for like three weeks. So, and Nikki's not coming, um, cause that'd just be too long for her to leave the boys. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm not really looking forward to being gone for three weeks. That's the only issue. Um, yeah, I'll miss you guys too. <laughs> 
but I'll probably bring my stuff because I still need to work while I'm there. I need to make YouTube videos and everything. So we might be able to still podcast like, yeah, yeah. we might be able to. So yeah, that's pretty much it for, uh, news for me, I guess. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll talk more about Tobago if it comes up, but, uh, yeah, Mike, uh, you have some, you know, unfortunate incident happened to you. Yes. Uh, last week I got a concussion. I caught a stray knee to the forehead pretty hard. Uh, I saw stars, sparks, didn't go out or anything, but um, I rolled. I kept rolling after that because I figured it was, it was nothing. But then later on that night, I was very nauseous and my pupils weren't responding properly and uh, I had vertigo. And I don't really remember much of the rest of that night. I did go in and see a doctor. They said it sounds like a, like a moderate concussion and to take some time off. So I took about five days off. And then I've been the last three days, I've been rolling very lightly with very select people who are like smaller than me. And I, I can handle a little bit more easily instead of going against, you know, like beasts like uh, Alex or anybody like that. I don't want to, he, although he would be gentle if he knew I had a head injury. I don't, I just, the, the weight difference, I couldn't handle that. And if I seem a little extra spacey today for the podcast, it's just the lights are kind of, kind of, hit my eyes and brighten. I can't even put a sentence together properly. Honestly, I'm not fully healed yet. Yeah. And I'm trying. It probably wasn't the best idea to to bring back the lights, right? If you have a concussion. (laughs) Yeah, it's okay. But no, like, um, it's definitely, you have to be very careful when you have a concussion, not to push too hard and, uh, you know, rally your brain too much, uh, extra. So, you know, you had to take a different approach to, to grappling, you know, being way more slower, more, yeah. more selective of your grips and that kind of stuff. That's, that's what I was saying earlier was, uh, thanks for reminding me. Um, I was noticing that my game has changed a lot. And then even in the last three days, I've noticed is I'm, my grips have purpose now. I'm not just grabbing just to grab. I'm grabbing with purpose to sweep or to pass. So because before I would just grab and, you know, hope for the best is the dumbest way to roll ever. But I you know, I caught myself doing it. Now this way I find like everything seems way more easy. You know what I mean? Like the, the path to get past is easier with grips that have purpose. So grips are everything I'm finding. Man, grips are everything. And I try to stress that so much. And one thing was a really interesting in Tobago and even here, um, cause we had an Australian guy come, uh, visit for a week. And w- when I'm rolling with people, I'm just it, more than it could, because it's kind of different when you roll the same people over and over, they can kind of like, uh, see what you're, they kind of know what you're going to try to do and, and can watch out for it. But r- rolling with all these new people, um, one thing that they all did was just give up underhooks constantly. And like, I'm just in my guard, uh, just relaxed, you know, and not letting, not letting them get grips. And, uh, next thing I know, I see the elbows open, I take the underhook and then I sweep them. And, um, you know, people just need to be so much more disciplined with their grips and they would have so much more success, you know, because sometimes (laughs) what happened many times, I was like thinking like, are they going to give up the underhook? Am I going to get it? Like, are they going to do it? And every time it was like, Oh yeah, they uh, got the underhook, you know? So it's just such an important thing. So I like that you uh, brought that up that, you know, being in a kind of a compromised state, you need to be more aware of your grips and stuff like that. But you also need to be aware. You need, you need to be just as aware, even if you're not compromised. Yeah. Right. But it kind of puts things more, um, almost like more priority. Right. Yes. But, yeah, some well, people can learn from that and yourself as well going forward is like, that is the most important thing. It's like, don't let people get good grips. Be selective of your grips. Every grip needs a purpose, you know? And Yeah, and I've noticed that it just makes everything much more easy. There's, there's not 10 steps to go through if I do things properly. It cuts it down to three steps and then I'm past the guard. And it just has helped my game a lot. So I've, I'm, glad, I'm not glad I got a concussion, but I mean, at least I can take something from it and learn from it and apply it to my... Uh, my game now yeah someone i was talking to someone uh who came to the camp who really nice dude and uh you know he's asking me like not like um you know he was asking me basically like how do i make it look so easy like he uh understands that it's not but like how do i make it look that way and uh it's basically just because i'm very calm and confident about uh, grips right it's just i just know people need to to be able to do things to me which is grips and then not letting them have it. And, uh, you know, it just makes such a huge difference. Like grips are everything. That's how you, every technique, everything you do, it all starts with the grips and people just give up grips way too easy. Yeah. Joey. Yeah. Well, I mean like grips are your connection with another person. Um, like 
uh, you can have like chest to chest connections, which are good, but like the grip is the only actual like firm connection that's holding someone in place. So if you don't have good connections, how are you ever supposed to hold someone? Like when you're passing the guard, like Mike, when you were saying like having your grips in the right spot, like if your hands are in the right spot, you're stopping people from moving certain ways. You're limiting their options and you're making everything easier for you just by putting your hands in the right place. And, yep. it, and it seems silly. Like by purple belt, I should have had this down by now, but I, I challenge everybody out there to like go real slow and try. And you will see people of all belts use improper grips all the time. Yeah. That's what I mean. I was wrong. All these new people and it's just like the grips, it, that's what it really comes down to. And, you know, I think that we, like what you mentioned about, you know, being a purple and kind of realizing it now, but I feel like I didn't even realize it until I was like a black belt, honestly. Like I, I it was good and everything before that, but like the actual realization of, oh, this is what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm, do, I'm preventing the grips. I'm taking these grips. It's like, that wasn't really until I was a black belt and kind of started figuring it out more, figuring out, figuring out my own game even more. Yeah. So I think it's like totally normal, but, um, yeah, people need to work on their grips. And one thing, uh, I don't know, it's kind of off topic, I guess, but, um, someone mentioned Joey that, uh, you talk with a lot of like up, like, uh, you, you inflect upwards at the end of the sentences. So it always sounds like a question. <laughs> so they, they said, well, yeah, they, they, Maybe I'm asking questions. I don't know. I'm not an expert. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. They said they they, lo they love you, Joey. But they just brought that up. They thought was that thought was kind of funny. I was thinking like, oh yeah, that is true. Joey does talk a lot of like up inflection words. Like, uh, hey, I'll take. Yeah, it. I think me and Mike we talk uh -huh. a lot of down inflection. I think so. Yeah. Of all the comments I get in the YouTube comments for this, that's probably <laughs> the nicest one. So I'll take yeah, that. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you definitely uh, you ruffle some feathers at times, <laughs> but. I think you you are uh, a lot of people's favorite for sure. Yeah, because people always say either they tell me that you're their favorite or you're their favorite. If no one tells me I'm their favorite, <laughs> like, fuck, it's all right. I think you're a lot of people's favorite. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I guess we all share the love for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think another thing that happened to me last week. Uh, well, I know another thing that happened to me last week was my doctor has finally got my uh, testosterone levels where they should be, and wow, what a difference when everything comes together. It's crazy. He's got me at the top of the high end of normal. And uh, I just, I feel like a new person. I feel like a new person lately until I got my head smashed. But yeah. Yeah. Well, testosterone does help with um, concussions. That's what I've heard too. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's that you don't produce as much if you have a concussion. Yeah. I wish, I don't know. I, w I don't know the exact, but uh, yeah, I know there's benefits to it for sure. Shit. Damn, why are you tempting me like this, Mike? <laughs> why, why are you tempting me like this? Yeah. Well, you're almost at that. Oh. How old are you? Oh, I'm shit. 30. You got a ways to go. Uh, well, well, I'm a weathered <laughs> 30, though, man. I tell everyone, like, my body's, I'm a weathered well, like, 30. Like what Jordan was saying, I have heard on, on other podcasts, you know, uh, Dr. Joe Rogan say that um, people with head injuries, and we've all had head injuries, you know, it, it does lower their testosterone levels, uh, according to him. Yeah, I'm trying to bring my uh, my natural test uh, levels up as much as I can. So like I ordered um, like a ice bath thing. So like, oh, that, yeah. yeah, it's supposed to help with testosterone. And also, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to actually going in it. It's like one thing buying it and then it's yeah. and planning on going in it. And then the next thing is actually getting in there. Which I'll is, do it with you. Yeah, perfect. Because I'm going to I'm going to bring it to the gym. Like that's where it's going to be for uh, a couple of reasons. One. Um, I'm more likely to use it. And two, I don't have enough well water to, uh, <laughs> consistently fill it up. So, um, yeah, it's better at the gym. So yeah, I bought that. It should be here soon. I also bought a uh, mouth tape for, for sleeping. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. Like, no. oh yeah. So this is a really popular thing. Uh, oh, it's becoming popular where you tape your mouth shut, um, to sleep. So that you're forced to breathe through your nose and, uh, you're, you're supposed to get a lot more deeper of rest and which I assume helps your testosterone levels, but it just helps you overall with your overall health and it clears your, uh, your, like your sinuses more. And yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a little worried I'll die in my sleep to be honest, but, uh, I looked, um, I, I looked it up and no one's died so far. So I think I'll, I'll be all right. I do have a bit of a deviated septum. So, um, yeah, but apparently it can help that too, because you're just like, your body's like forced to like, um, you know, use it and, uh, yeah, be smart about it, not die. What happens if you have a, like a stuffed up nose? Yeah. That, I, I guess it can unstuff it by, 
by being forced to breathe through it. But I've also seen people recommend not to uh, risk it and uh, instead just take those times off and yeah, yeah, yeah. not use it. But yeah, as we'll see how that goes. I've, yeah. heard, I've heard, I heard about it a long time ago, but um, I could just never pull the trigger and actually do it. But I got enough, uh, you know, like Facebook and TikTok ads for it where I was like, okay, okay. I'll, you guys got me. I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. So how is mouth tape different than any other tape? Yeah. So um, people do use like 3M tape, which is a type of tape. Um, but the problem is you need to put like multiple uh, strips on. But this like this is like specific to putting on your face. So it's just one strip and it comes off your beard really easy. Right now, I don't have uh, much of a beard. I shaved it, but I got to I got to grow it back. But um, yeah, so. I'll let everyone know, know, know how that goes. Uh, or maybe I won't, maybe I'll die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, uh, well, I hope not. No, I hope not too. But you know, at the same time, I feel like they have to be pretty confident that no one's going to die if they're going to sell it because they would get sued pretty fast. Right? Yeah. I have sleep apnea, so I have to wear one of those great big masks. Well, I'm supposed to wear one of those great big masks. Um, my sleep apnea is horrible. So I think I got to get that sorted out before I start taping my mouth shut. Yeah, 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 let me know how it goes. Yeah, I think with sleep apnea, it's like not recommended, but um, apparently your body will just wake up and start breathing through his nose. I don't know, but uh, I'm a big time mouth breather. Um, oh, me too. Yeah, especially when I'm sleeping. It sounds like I'm snoring, but it's not snoring. It's just like really heavy breathing. And uh, my daughter's like that too, even worse than me. Like I should get some tape for her because sleeping in the same hotel as her uh, in Tobago, you can really hear how loud it is. Like, holy crap, Audrey, like, <laughs> slow down with your breathing actually my boys too they they're all big time mouth breathers are so loud so i don't know what's going on there but um yeah maybe they can sponsor the whole family the the melt tape place and you know get us all sorted out hey, you get that sponsor i get a just for men sponsor for my beard we're sorted yeah yeah well we also we do need to get an element sponsor for the podcast because you know like so someone said uh yeah we didn't like a great job promoting it because we did because we actually like Element. Yeah, I, I love it. I take it every day. The mistake I made was I didn't bring any to Tobago. Um, and then I was there. I was like, shit, why didn't I bring any? Because I still have some, but yeah, it's all good. Support for Talk Jitsu is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in men's blow the waist grooming. Their products are precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped Performance Package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code JTJ at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, that's about 14 million balls. So what's your experience been with uh, Manscaped? Well, I've used probably a half a dozen different na name brand products before, and they're terrible. I've cut myself every time. And these are very expensive, very well-named brand products. And with Manscaped, I've never cut myself. Exactly. And you know what I like the most about uh, the Manscaped Razor is it has a flashlight on it. And you oh, think that's the best. It's amazing. You think that, oh, it's just this like, you know, feature or whatever, but actually it's kind of like... Uh, when you've experienced a light uh, a light on your razor you may, it makes you wonder why no other ones have that too because this is a game changer you can just see everything so much easier you know even if you don't have the perfect lighting so that was my that was my favorite aspect of it i was actually shocked how uh how, how much better it made too because i was you know doing my neckline and everything so oh, I, I can actually see where the line should be right because there's a light it's so simple and so smart so i really like that from manscaped 100 percent. i thought is this a gimmick and then i tried it i was like no this is this is the way it's the only razor i've ever had that has a light on it and it really <laughs> lights the way to to the way <laughs> to shaving your balls it does it makes all the difference i think a lot of uh, other brands are maybe more towards like your hair or just your beard or something right but this is like the full package so yeah. uh, guys jtj at checkout let's go hey joey did you say that you have a match coming up yeah yeah tomorrow night actually so we're filming this on a friday i have a super fight on saturday night so but something's gone on. You said something changed. Yeah, I guess my original opponent got hurt or something. So I think it was Monday. They messaged me asking if I would take a new opponent. And then they asked if I would switch from gi to no gi. And so, uh -huh. yeah, now I'm like my whole match. Like I've been training for like a gi match for one guy for like three weeks. And now I'm doing a no gi match with a different guy. I'm like, if I'm being honest, like I don't want to do it. I like I have zero desire to do this. It's this huge inconvenience in my life right now 
Yeah, I hate when things get switched up like last minute, and then also like it just it it is impactful like competing like when you have other things going on, you got to worry about that too. So yeah, and like this is the first tournament that our gym is competing in, just because like we're a new gym. Uh, I think we've got like seven or eight guys competing, so I'm like, you know, I'm dealing with that and like trying to make sure everyone else is ready, and haven't really been able to put like the time into my own game and work on myself, but also like my shoulders. uh, gotten worse trying to train a little bit harder so the the rules were originally like a 10 minute sub only with an ebi overtime and the ebi overtime uh you couldn't start on the back you were supposed to start in the spider web position so the only thing i asked them is if we're going to do noki can we not do the spider web because i actually can't grip my hands together and pull uh like i i can't do it like a child could pull my hands apart from the spider web. So I'm like, yeah, if we start there, like I just, I lose, it's, it's, it's not possible. So they, they said, sure, well, we're going to do like a ref's decision or something if there's no submission. Yeah. I mean, have you thought about not even doing it? It sounds like a really big inconvenience. <laughs> well, I've thought about it. Like I messaged the guys who are running it and I'm, I'm trying to kind of do them a favor. Cause I know a lot of people have pulled out of their matches that they've set up. And I was kind of like, Hey, listen, like my shoulders really bad. Like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty injured. Like if you really need me to do this, I'll do it. But like, I am pretty injured and they were just kind of like, well, that sucks. Good luck. <laughs> it's like, wow. all right, <laughs> I guess I'll do it. Yeah. What they should do is be like, that's no problem. You know, we value your safety and your health over everything. And, uh, we understand because, you know, pulling out of a jiu-jitsu match last minute isn't a huge deal to me like uh mma it's way different like mma you put in way more preparation and uh you don't want to do that to somebody but like if it's like a last minute replacement and it's just jiu-jitsu um yeah i I think that you should just prioritize yourself and your team and just uh get get them on the next one but yeah it's been a it's like a really hard decision i've been like flip-flopping back and forth all week and it's it's tough because we are like a new gym too. And I know a lot of our newer members were like really excited to have me compete. And like, it's weird. Like a part of me wants to do it just to be like, Hey, look, you know, I'm willing to do it. I'm going to push through some difficulties and, you know, win or lose, like I'm going to at least put myself out there and give it a go. But then another part of me is like, I don't want to compete so compromised that I'm setting myself up for failure. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're compromised, you're compromised. So I don't know. I think you should rethink it personally. Like I said, it's just jujitsu. It's just jujitsu. I've never had a super fight. I I can imagine they are um, stressful. They're pretty stressful. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I I prefer super fights over tournaments. Um, just because I don't. What I don't like about tournaments is just like being there waiting all day and it's really hot and like uh, yeah. I just. I just prefer super fights. You you just have one match and you know who you're going against. And I don't know. I like performing in front of a crowd too. I think it's uh, kind of fun. Some people get like nervous. Yeah, that'd be me. Yeah, for me, it kind of like fires me up. And um, because I don't care, like um, I don't get nervous that way. I just get nervous. Like, all I care about is winning. That's like the only priority. So like that doesn't impact me that way. So I just want to, um, yeah, like putting on a show and, and hearing the crowd. So yeah, I like I like super fights. I'm the same way. I much prefer a super fight over a full tournament. It's just also like, it's nicer knowing you just have to go in, do one match and then it's done. I don't have to worry about like, you know, holding, you know, like you've got another match if you win this in 10 more minutes. So you got to give it your all to win this, but not so much that you wouldn't be able to compete again for your next match. Just like, Hey, you know, you got 10 minutes, man. At the end of the 10 minutes, if you're not exhausted, you didn't give it everything. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. It's like so much, uh, it, it, it's just like more, um, I guess, comforting in a way, knowing that you can put your all into it and not have to worry after because I've had it this one time at a tournament uh, in the semifinals. It was such a hard match that like I was so dead after where like I couldn't even like get up. And they were nice to um, give me some extra time to recover. I was super fucked up. And, um, but then I did go into the finals match like, so compromised like i i couldn't even move my body barely and then i ended up losing which uh really was frustrating because the guy i lost to i already beat twice before that and then i beat him like three like two or three times after that so 
I know I could have beat him if it was and won the gold medal if uh, you know if it was a super fight or if I had paced myself better for the for the match before that. So I think that super fights can be more exciting. Um, and you know what's interesting is who popularized super fights it was uh, a Gracie. It was uh, what well, is it Horion? Is that is that the is that was that the Gracie? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which one? The uh, but I thought Helio no, was Halek. the first one. No, the super, the super, the first real super fight was Metamorris, who uh, I think is Halig, who Halleck, put it on. Yeah. Oh, Halig, Halig, yeah. yeah. So he's a brother of um, Huron and Henner, and uh, he's the one that did, did the G, the G and the Gi. Um, oh, that's a great song. Yeah, for those that don't know, um, he's a G and a Gi. So yeah. He he, uh, he made a rap song about it. It was super cool, not yeah. cringe at all. No, it's amazing. And uh, yeah, great lyrics. He's uh, yeah. I'm not gonna sing it for you. I thought about it, but uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I thought you meant Helio Gracie when he fought Kimura. I thought because well, that would be the ultimate first super fight, would it not? Yeah, I mean, like there might have been like that kind of more primitive of uh, super fights back then, um, in the sense that like you know the professionalism and like uh, kind of whole event kind of thing kind of really started uh, in popularity, at least with, yeah. with Metamorris. I loved Metamor I loved Metamorris when it was on. Yeah. Metamorris, yeah. it was great. The issue with it was they, um, didn't pay their athletes. Yeah. That is an issue. And I assume that like, how can you not make a lot of money? Because like everyone was talking about Metamorris, uh, when it happened, it was like the biggest thing in jujitsu and it really transformed, uh, jujitsu going forward because, I'd never seen a super fighter, even heard of one before that, even though I was, um, you know, newer into jiu-jitsu back then, but that was like a, it felt like such a monumental uh, event. And it was really cool looking too, like they did a great job of production and, and the aesthetic. And uh, yeah, you just didn't pay anyone. Oh, I don't know about anyone, or you didn't pay everyone. And uh, some of the matches were boring too. Not the first one, I think the first one was pretty good. And the second one, um, you know, we got the famous like uh, shop, uh, oh, yeah. the shop shut down. Yeah. Which is basically what happened was Brennan Schaub went against Cyborg uh, Brayu, I guess his last name. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he just like disengaged the whole time. So he didn't lose, but he never really engaged either, which is something that's really frustrating to watch. But it's also frustrating to, uh, to when you are rolling and someone does that, you know, that happens way too much, way more than it should. Uh, people just disengaging. And that's actually what we did in Ogi class um, last night. We're working on how to deal with people that are disengaging, that are just going in and out, in and out. And uh, w the one tactic is to wrestle up when they, so when they engage, when they go to disengage after that, it's a good time to shoot for a double or single with a wrestle up. So, you know, there are tactics against it, but it's just a super lame tactic, especially if people spend their hard earned money, um, you know, to watch it. And then you're just going to, do nothing so yeah but brendan's job is he's lame in a lot of ways but yeah. uh that was like the lamest thing he's ever done for sure metamorris 3 is what got me into you know how i love lockdown in the electric chair it's because of metamorris 3 that's watching him rematch uh hoyler and he just kept doing it over and over and over again i thought in my head if he can do that and hoyler didn't adjust he must have swept him five times and locked him down the whole time and did everything if he can't adjust after the second or third time then it must be a semi-useful tool and i've been using it ever since i know a lot of people don't like it and a lot of people say it doesn't work but it, like I said, i've hit it on some really good people uh, i've focused uh, on that move for four years i've been doing it for <laughs> all the time but yeah that's where i learned it was watching that yeah so for those who don't know uh it's eddie bravo who owns 10th planet uh runs 10th planet and he's the one that kind of popularized lo uh, lockdown i don't know if he like uh invented it in the sense that he took a lot of um a lot of techniques from wrestling yeah. um that he kind of adapted into jiu-jitsu but uh, yeah i definitely um you can definitely take that claim to fame for that technique, even if it was around before. But uh, yeah, what happened was, is that like way back in the day, um, Eddie Bravo beat Hoyler Gracie in a, in a match, which was like unheard of, like, you know, just this like random, like American beating this like Brazilian legend. And um, yeah, he then, you know, that's kind of how like Eddie Bravo got his uh, claim to fame was really uh, beating Hoyler Gracie and uh, really well launched him and his jujitsu career. And now like he's taken full advantage of that with 10 planet everywhere. And uh, it's a great, a great system, great school. But uh, yeah, it, it's kind of cool and interesting in a way where like that wouldn't have happened if he didn't beat Hoyler, yeah. like his whole life changed from beating Hoyler. 
and um you know some people call it a fluke and whatever but then um but then yeah he, he uh they rematched at Meta Morris and he proved that it wasn't a fluke like it was yeah. it was a draw but it was pretty clear who was uh in control the whole time when he had him in the vaporizer at the end and Hoyler's leg looked like it was going to bend sideways like that was insane i don't know how he didn't tap from that but they say he doesn't tap from joint locks only you know from uh like chokes and stuff like that but is that because his like body can is bendable or is that because his uh he's stubborn well <laughs> right. I, I think a little bit of both they said that um he's very very flexible for one and two he's just stubborn he will not tap for a joint lock he'll just let it go yeah he's probably still feeling that vaporizer to this day well afterwards he kind of he tried to jump around to show that it didn't hurt, but man, his, his knee was cracking and popping and it was sideways. I mean, that had to have hurt. Yeah. It's like saying, well, you dominated me the whole time, but I'm not hurt. I'm yeah. fine. So, you know, not a big deal, but yeah. bro, you know, you lot, you, that's the thing with like these super fights, um, that if, if it were submission only, you can just dominate the shit out of someone and then, um, <laughs> and just be a draw or you get your ass kicked the whole time and it's a draw because you didn't get submitted. So yeah I, yeah it's lame just well, have just have judges like yeah. it's not that hard who's number one does it like there's a match at the end a judge picks like three judges or whatever pick who won it's it's that simple i mean sure sometimes judges are going to get it wrong but it's at least more satisfying than be like well this was a draw because one guy was clearly winning but the other guy was stubborn enough to just not tap and get dominated for 15 or whatever minutes but it's a draw yeah, I mean, a lot of sports have judges, and that it's just ingrained into the sport. You couldn't have the sport otherwise. And I think jujitsu, that's the way you got to do it because having that over like overtime round or just being a draw is lame. But then overtime really screws people up too. Like, you know, when I had my match against Caesar, um, it would have been a two minute overtime, and it, that overtime was going to be judged separately from the rest of the match. So my worry was that I would just dominate and kick his ass the whole time for 10 minutes, but in the process get really tired. And then, you know, maybe one thing goes wrong during overtime that you shoot for a takedown or, or one little bad thing. It's like, shit, now I lost the whole match, even though, you know, I should have won. And then, you know, you also have to, it makes you like pace yourself too, where, you know, you want to give it all to your, to the fans, not be like, okay, I might have to do two more minutes. So maybe I shouldn't like, you know, go too hard on this. Right. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, yeah, I think judges yeah, are way I better. I don't understand that. If you're going to judge, why not just judge off the 10-minute match? Like, what's the point of doing another overtime and then judging on the overtime? Like, you're already bringing judges into the equation. The overtime's not solving that problem. Yeah. So just judge off the match. Yeah, exactly. Especially now it's going to be judged over a two-minute match instead of a 10-minute match. Yeah. How the hell does that make sense? It makes zero sense. So, yeah, I think it's super lame. But also, um, you know... I don't like the whole spider web or taking the back kind of thing either because it doesn't necessarily show who's the better grappler because who's the better grappler is the one that's not going to be put in the bad position. So if you get put in a bad position uh, against someone that you wouldn't have let them get there otherwise, sometimes it doesn't matter um, who's better. Um, you know, they might be just better at like breaking the armbar grip or they got kind of lucky of like, um, you just made one little mistake and then they capitalized on it. Right. So yeah. And, and that, that's the thing too, it leads more to like shop shutdowns during the actual, um, the match itself. Cause they're like, Oh, I'm just going to conserve my energy. Um, just waiting for the overtime and then I'll do my best to tap you there, but I'm not going to put any energy in now, you know, it's an actual match. And yeah, this episode is brought to you by minimal snacks. Let's uh, try it out. Yeah. So Minimal Snacks, it's a, like a beef jerky uh, company, basically, and uh, it's just a good source of protein. And I know uh, you've tried it already, and so have I. It's great. Yeah. It's good for a keto diet if you're on a or a low carb diet as well. It's very moist. It's yes. not like your regular beef jerky where it takes you six years to chew through it. And anybody that listens to this podcast know that most of my teeth are fake. It's hard to even chew any meat. This is great. Yeah, that's the best part for sure. It's yeah. actually moist. It's actually yeah. easy to chew. Because like Very. you said, some beef jerky is just like a jaw workout. Yeah, it's terrible. I don't um, want to work on my jaw when I'm eating beef jerky. How would you describe the taste? Oh, man. A little bit sweet, salty. It's nice. It's not too heavy salt. It's not too sweet. It's perfect. I'm not just saying this because they sponsor us. Like, I I would buy this and eat it every day. I love this. I ate three packages the other day. And there's only... Uh, very few ingredients it's just beef red wine vinegar shiitake extract and salt so the 
the less ingredients, the better. So yeah. she, and there's no chemicals involved. So go to minimalsnacks.com and enter TalkJitsu20 to get your discount on some of the best stuff I've ever had. I think ADCC. I used to be a fan of EBI rules. I think my favorite now is ADCC rules. I think that'll be uh, universals. Yeah, I mean, I think especially with, like, the ADCC Open, it's like um, people are going to get more familiar with the rules because I think one problem they have with the rules is that, it's just that they're a little confu- confusing. Like, I don't really underst- I don't really understand the rules, but um, no one's ever explained them to me either. But I, from what I've, like, read, it, it looks a little confusing, at least from l- the little bits I've seen. For the first five minutes, I believe there's no points. And then if you pull guard, you, you're you minus a point. Uh, it it depends on the level of the tournament um so like the elite division the finals actually have a slightly different rule set than regular like tournament bracket matches which i think is a little strange um so like during the regular tournament you can pull guard during the non-points period um and it's not penalized it's just when you move into the points period pulling guard becomes penalized um in finals pulling guard at any point during the match will result in a negative one even during the non-points period so like i think that's a little strange to have a slightly different rule set for a finals than like you know maybe someone's been pulling guard and triangling everyone in 10 seconds all the way up to the finals and now they get a guy who they can't triangle but they're still pulling guard now you're getting penalized for it so you're kind of selecting for different things when you change the rules but i i like it i like that it encourages wrestling at least um they definitely have some weird like nuances with their rules like certain matches like the duration of the match changes length based on like where you are in the tournament so like finals are longer than non-finals matches uh it, it's an interesting rule I, set i kind of like that though where the finals are longer just because it's more important you know it's like you can have more energy for the finals by not having the other matches be quite as long so I think that's kind of cool. And I think you can slam your way out of a submission, but that's the only time you can slam is if you're a threat of being submitted. And only is only right, in the professional divisions. So if you sign up for like intermediate or just like a regular advanced, you can't. Um, but if you sign up for like the, the pro divisions, you can slam out of a submission. Yeah. I like that. You know, yeah. like I would never like that for like recreational practitioners yeah. or anything like that. But like, if you're a pro uh, competitor, you should know when you should let go of something because someone's going to slam you. And if you hold on to it uh, because just because you want to and you're stubborn and then you get slammed, well, your life might end. Like literally you become a paraplegic or something like that. I watched uh, <laughs> just a clip on Instagram yesterday where the, uh, the, the guy was in a triangle and, or no, he was an arm. It was an arm bar and the guy just lifted him up like so high and, uh, he had so much time to let go. Like, what does he think the guy's going to do to him? I like, saw that. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty clear. He's going to get slammed and it's like, bro, let go. So, you know, and is it, it is a, re- a realistic tactic, um, in self-defense or fighting or, you know, in, in grappling if the rule set allows it. So like, I think it should be just fine. in um, yeah, yeah, in, in, in competitive jiu-jitsu. Well, Jeff Glover versus Gio Martinez, if anybody wants an example of somebody slamming themselves to a win, uh, Gio uh, picks him up, Jeff Glover up in a triangle, and just slams him hard, and Jeff is out of it after that. He's just kind of rolling around. as You can tell he's not with it, and then, you know, he just submitted him, and that was over. Yeah, I mean, we're realistically, slam should never happen because the person getting slammed should avoid it, right? It's their fault. If they get slammed, it's their fault. And I never like seeing, I, I don't like seeing slams. Like, one of the worst things I ever seen was in the UFC, it was uh, Jordan Levitt versus uh, Matt Wyman. And uh, I, I forget what, it was close guard. He picked him up from close guard and just slammed the shit out of him. And Matt Wyman was out uh, cold for a long time. And I legit was worried. Like, I, I did not feel good from watching that. And I was like, I think this guy might be dead. Yeah, did I just watch somebody die? Yeah, yeah honestly. And I don't... I'll, like, it's not often I feel about, like that in MMA because it doesn't really happen that often where someone gets uh, put it put to sleep for so long. Um, so, yeah, I felt a little, like, gross almost watching it. It, it was nasty. But, like, bro, let go like let go get to your feet no one's keeping you there so you know it's i would never wish that upon someone but i also realize that it's their own fault completely yeah the same happened with tito ortiz and i can't remember the man who passed he passed away he was a middleweight champion at one time too he got slammed by tito and he was out and the fertitas thought that they just witnessed somebody die because he was out for like five minutes i can't remember his name but uh 
Yeah. Yeah. Like what's going on in Evan Tanner. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like what's going on in the brain when that's happening? You know what I mean? Like your brain just got rattled to shit. And then it's just like, I guess, um, trying to come back to normal from that. Like, I wonder like what the actual processes are going on there. It's definitely concuss. Oh yeah. 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 The, the worst one I've ever seen though was Ricardo Rona uh, and Rampage Jackson. Cause he ended with a headbutt to the, to the face as he slams him. It was brutal in pride. Well, what do you guys think for like, um, for any levels, even recreational where it, they, they could have a rule where if you get picked up where you could be slammed, um, then it's just similar to a submission because I kind of like that in a sense, if, as long as the ref doesn't, um, you know, do any bullshit calls, but like if you pick someone right up in the air, um, it's basically a submission because you could just kill them right there. Right. So like it just ends the match. It's submissions over. You lost. Like you think you guys think that's bullshit. I think at black belt level, anything should be, uh, if two guys agree to it, anything should be uh, possible. But I don't know. I'm not a black belt, and I'd never be in that situation. So what are the black belts? I've think? actually, like, had this conversation before. I think if, like, you're playing close guard or, like, you're trying to armbar someone, and they can pick you up in the air and hold you for a couple seconds, it should be two points, and you start standing. Like, hey, you yeah. picked the guy up. You could have slammed him to death. Now, we, you know, you don't know. He might have been fine off the slam and finished his arm bar. So I don't like the idea of just like giving him a win. Cause then I think you'll just see a bunch of guys trying to pick people up. You'll get a bunch of like good old corn fed American wrestlers, just picking up their <laughs> opponents and being like, look, I win. I picked him up. I bench pressed him. Uh, but I think just give him two points. Now you restart standing. That's your punishment, man. You can't let people pick you up. Yeah. I like that idea. You know, now you mentioned, I think that's better than just being like a uh, match is over submission. Like, yeah, even like four points, honestly, like, I think you should be rewarded for that because if you have the strength and ability to lift someone up and slam them and, you know, you do, uh, do it halfway through. Yeah. I think there should be, um, you should be rewarded for that, you know, cause it's kind of similar to like, um, you know, when you go out, out of bounds from a submission, it's like, you know, you get points for that. Um, you have to restart. I don't know. Sometimes they restart when they're in the submission still, depending on the tournament. Yeah. I think that might be a rough learning curve though. Cause you see people now slamming people at IBJJF tournaments all the time. There's tons of videos online. So if they're actually allowed to pick them up, I think you're going to see a lot of people just say, fuck it. And just dump them on their head a lot. Yeah. So but, now that I rethink that, I don't know if that should be allowed. Yeah. But I don't think slamming should be allowed, but picking them up it, to slam, but then not. Right. right that's right? what I'm saying. I think a lot of people are just going to pick them up and uh, say, forget that. You know what I mean? Cause like it happens now and it's not allowed. Yeah. So if it's allowed to even pick them up and, and get points, I think you're going to see a lot of people fuck up and slam people. As a ref, yeah. almost every slam I've ever seen in a tournament has been an accident. Uh, it's usually that case. Someone's trying to, you know, stand up or posture to get out of an arm bar and they pick the guy up and then they slip and you're both yeah, going yeah. down together. And like, it's still a slam, man. You, you if you're going to pick someone up, you have to have control. Like it's your job. If you're picking someone up, not to slam them on their head. But at the same time, I think there is some responsibility. Like if you're the guy on bottom, you know, don't let someone pick you up. You know, things happen in jujitsu. Like, uh, I'll tell a funny story because it was a few tournaments ago. One of the guys I was coaching when I was at Gracie Baja won his second match in a tournament by knockout. He, wow. he collar dragged a dude and instead of basing wow. or doing anything, the guy just let his arms go limp and face planted face first into the match. And the other guy's coach was like, when he, they went out and they were like, the wind, his coach said something like, oh, I was a slam. I was like, What? Like that's, that's not a slam. Yeah. Like you, you have to be responsible for yourself. Like if someone's collar dragging you and you're just like, oh, just let my face hit the mat. You got to live with those consequences. Same thing. Like if you're getting picked up, even if slams are illegal, there is a chance you get smacked into the ground by accident. He might not intend to do it. Like they are illegal. It's against the rules, but it can happen, man. So don't get picked up. Don't let it happen. Don't take the chance. Yeah. You can't, you can't rely on the rules to save you. You know, you gotta, you gotta take care of yourself at all times, protect yourself at all times. <laughs> like that's so important. And when it comes to collar drags, uh, one of our students, um, yeah, Owen, he got, he got collar dragged really hard and he hurt his shoulder and, um, uh, sucks to be him. It's, yeah, it sucks to be him. That, that definitely sucked. Uh, but one thing that, um, what he said, I really, I don't know if I mentioned this in the podcast, but I was talking to him after and, uh, he said, you know, 
you know, this, this is a combat sport. We're not doing ballet. You know, th these things happen. I'm like, damn right. Like this, that's the exact mentality you should have. And that, that's one thing I said to him you know, before it was like, this is a combat sport. This isn't ballet. So it was really cool to hear him, uh, you know, say that back to me and, uh, because that's the right mentality, but you know, I don't think like collar drags are even that effective, um, to, against someone that kind of knows how to defend against them because you know what you should do if you're getting collar dragged is um you know like like go to your knees like so you can stand up right away you can't let someone just pull you right down you just need to prioritize getting to your knees which like uh wrestlers judokas are really good at because they don't want to have their back on the mat there's like so much that um jiu-jitsu can learn from uh, other sports like wrestling and uh and judo Something I forgot to ask you when you were talking about rolling the uh, black belt in judo, like uh, his grip strength, was it like insane? Like, yeah. yeah, and he took grips right away with, without like, it was so easy for him. But like, you know, I'm not the best judoka, that's for sure. Like I'm confident in my wrestling, but uh, my judo is severely lacking. But when he took those grips, I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to be able to break these. Um, but you know, it's interesting too, cause judo, judo, they, they grip differently than, um, than what I'm used to in, uh, in jiu-jitsu. So like in judo, they take a lot of like, uh, cross side grips or they'll take like kind of outside grips on your collar kind of behind you. And those kind of things can lead to, um, you know, like lower body takedowns, uh, which they don't have to worry about, which is why they do them. But not everything is completely transferable to jujitsu when you add in like because it's a different rule set so the grips he took um were good for judo to take me down but they weren't good for um preventing the wrestling right so when he took like a grip behind me there was like nothing blocking me from actually going to his legs so um it worked out in my favor and it was just kind of like inexperienced for him um you know going with people that can attack the legs and it's just super lame that they took out uh <laughs> grabbing the legs in judo because they used to, used to be able to uh, do that. So I don't know, like, could you do like double legs and single legs in judo in the past or it, were there still kind of restrictions there? Do you, do you know, Joey? I'm not an expert. I think they had something approximating it. Um, I started judo a well after that had been taken out. So I'm not an expert in that. Yeah. I really want to start judo just for fun because I feel like that's an area of my game. I've never, never explored you know just always uh even in the gi just always searching for like more wrestling uh style of takedowns and what judo guys are really good at is um and i asked someone what it's called but i, I can't remember like the japanese term but it's like basically like moving you around forcing you to step and um as they force you to step that's when they go for the, their their like their foot sweeps and stuff like that because it creates openings for it and they're just so good at uh yeah at forcing that step where like uh jiu-jitsu athletes in, in the gi like they're just so like uh stagnant they're just like nothing's happening and uh but against the judo guy they know how to move you around so that's something I really want to explore for myself, like really uh, getting good at that, the getting people to move their legs. And as they do going for foot sweeps or like uh, Uchimata's, all that kind of stuff. Like I have like, you know, a very basic judo game, not great. Um, but I, I think that would improve it immensely because I know, you know, what techniques are available. Like I know, like, you know, I know how to do foot sweep. I know how to do Uchimata. I know how to do Osotogari and stuff like that. But actually setting it up is where I kind of run into issues. Um, and, and that's how they set it up. So, yeah, that's something I want to get better at. I like when you teach it in class, you always prioritize your uh, training partner's safety. Yeah. To get them on their tippy toes before you try to do a massive throw rather than, you know, torque their knee. Yeah, exactly. And that like, because we were doing hip throws yesterday and um, because, you know, I learned so much from my experience uh, accidentally hurting Joey, unfortunately, but we've talked about this on the podcast before, but yeah, his, uh, his foot was planted and I went for it anyways. I thought, you know, I could force this, but, um, I didn't really, re I didn't realize what the consequences would be, but now I do know what they are. And, uh, now I'd like to stress that so much. And I stress it so much, uh, last night, every time I teach hip throws, it's like, do not do this if their foot is planted, you need to get them on their tippy toes. And then you show them how to get them on the tippy toes. And then, then they're safe takedowns because it's just like, cringing otherwise seeing people go for uh, hip throws that don't prioritize that because I know what the consequences can be so that's yeah, something that's very important to me like I think that every instructor as they're teaching they should also point out like the like the 
danger uh, of the techniques because a, a, not all techniques have um, dangerous aspects to them, but many do. Like many are safe if done safely, but then many are dangerous if not done safely. And I feel like it's so ignored of like uh, teaching people the safety aspect of it. And I don't really get why. Yeah, you always do that, especially with a danger, like quote unquote dangerous uh, techniques, like say heel hooks, where if you do crank a little hard, you can, you know, fuck somebody's knee up for months and maybe even a year if, if, if it's uh, bad enough, right? If, if they need new ACL or something like that. Yeah. You know, you know I find this in general, like um, a lot of people go really hard on submissions, like from other gyms, like this is something I've, I've noticed big time, like watching YouTube videos or just going to other gyms, but like our gym, because I preach it so much, everyone is uh, pretty slow in their approach of actually finishing. And that, that's the way it has to be. You can go fast to actually to lock in the submission. There's no problem, but to actually finish, if you can do it slow, you can do it fast. And if you can do it slow, you gain control, understanding of control. And there's just so many benefits of finishing slow and there's zero benefits of finishing fast. So I don't get why that's not preached as much as it is because people get hurt all the time because uh, the person went too fast, too hard. And then, you know, they might be thinking, oh, I should have tapped sooner, whatever. And maybe they blame, blame themselves, but that should never happen. It should, that should not be part of jiu-jitsu. People should never get hurt from submissions. They should only get hurt and they shouldn't get hurt. But the only reason they should get hurt is freak, freak accidents, like things that were just, they zigged when they should have zagged and just created this like freak accident. That's really unfortunate. But, um, you know, a submission is not a freak accident. It's a negligence. No, like yeah. I was showing a, a heel hook the other night at our gym and I, you know, I put my Yuki in a heel hook and I put it on and I was like trying to explain to my guys, like, look, the, the finish here is the last piece. What matters is the control. So like, I'll put the control on with the legs and I'll leave my hands. So I'll be like, all right, to the guy I'm doing it to be like, try and get out, try and move. And, you know, you give him like five, six seconds. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm like, I don't have to crank this submission fast. I have all the time in the world because this guy's not going anywhere. He's completely controlled. And then, you know, it's the same thing. Like when I have a Kimura, like you pull it free and you're like, try and move. And they're like, I can't move. And you're like, yeah, I can finish this like the slowest rotation possible. And, you know, I really try and stress to like my students, like if you feel like you have to go fast or you're going to lose it, there's something wrong with your submission long before the finishing mechanic. If you feel like you can't do it slow, it means you're not doing it right. So we got to go back and fix it. And I think that's a big problem is, you know, a lot of gyms like, I'm, oh God, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. <laughs> I always do this. Uh, I think a lot of gyms like don't necessarily teach the controls well of submissions. They just teach like, this is how we finish. And then when their guys try and do this in rolling, because they haven't practiced the control as much, they just want the cool aspect of like, oh, this made him tap. They have to go fast or they find they lose it every time they roll. Like, you know, I see it with guys from other gyms come in and I see them go for an arm bar and they're, they're just cranking right away. But then I look and like their knees are splayed super wide and you're like, yeah, of course you feel like you have to go fast. Your control is dog shit. You couldn't hold this guy for four seconds if you tried, if your life depended on it. So of course that guy's cranking nice and fast. It's the only way he's ever going to finish anything. But if we do it all right, like knees are pinched, you know, everything's in the right spot. My grips are good. I can hold you for, I can put you in the arm bar and hold you for two minutes. If I wanted, you're not going to go anywhere. Exactly. Nice, easy finish. Because speed can kind of make up for poor technique. And uh, that's what we want to avoid. Because if you can have perfect technique, then you can do it fast with that technique. But if you uh, have to rely on speed and other factors, um, you're not going to have great technique. It's actually similar to like, uh, talk about it in, uh, like in my arm triangle video that I posted a couple weeks ago, where you don't need to squeeze uh, to finish the choke until it's completely locked in. So you have a perfect bite and you're ready and you're ready for the submission. If you squeeze first, you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to be wasting time and energy and you, you're going to need to use other things other than a perfect bite to actually get the finish of like doing all this weird stuff that people do, like, you know, rotating around and getting their body far away, driving to the side this way or whatever. So you don't need to do any of that. Just like have a good bite on your, on your arm triangle and you'll be good to go. Prioritize that, prioritize good technique. And uh, you don't need to do the extra stuff. And a good example uh, too of like um, con con control, like teaching you how to be like better um, for your submissions is 
last night we were doing in the kids class we were uh doing um we did some arm bars and it was the advanced class and i told them like go like really slow and have your partner like try to rotate their arm and uh side to side and you need you need to control their wrist so that it stays uh pointed the same way as your hips and then just go really slow in the submission and um you know a, like a lot of them they weren't perfect in their control at first like because normally when they go for arm bars um they they just kind of go do them fast like they don't crank them we never had any problems but they you know they do them kind of fast and you know the person taps no injury or anything but like they're not they're like missing out on key details um and technical aspects of it that that they're going to gain from going slow. So over the course of that class, I could see like how much better their control of the wrist was. And, um, and then they're not going to lose arm bars anymore. So like that kind of stuff is just so important. Like teach people how to, to control way more so than fit to, to like than anything else. Right. It's, it's yeah, the same thing with leg locks or anything like that. That's what I meant earlier when I was saying I slowed everything down in the last three days that I've been rolling, uh, exactly what you just explained uh, i have had better techniques sharper technique and i can i've learned that i can, if i can do it slow like that i'm doing it properly yeah you know like this is one thing that's interesting too like people in the tobago camp a lot and just people say this a lot how like my style is very like uh very like relaxed until i find uh, my opportunity and then i'll explode more and just take advantage of it. it's time to go right so like and then i was thinking like yeah, that's my style. But like, why isn't everyone like that? You know what I mean? Like, why doesn't everyone, why doesn't, why is that kind of like a weird style not weird, but kind of like a notable style, right? Because like, why, why try to like force things that aren't there? Why not be relaxed? You know, why waste energy doing this and that? Like you, re relaxing when you're rolling makes life so much easier. You know, you can think so much uh, clearer and you can find opportunities and it's just, you can be smarter about your grips as opposed to just like ah, yeah, going like crazy. Right. So, yeah, and I think that is something that, um, you know, it, it's really something you're experiencing now, not that you weren't like that before, but you're going to experience it more and more now. Like why, you know, yeah. Like why like, uh, put all this effort in now, like just relax and then, Oh, here's an opportunity. Now I'm going to take it. Now I'm going to use my energy. So yeah, that was, that was something that was pretty cool. Yeah. hundred percent. It's, it's going to change my game for the better. I'm, gonna take this concussion and learn from it and make myself a better jujitsu player yeah yeah perfect so yeah um i guess there's not really anything else i wanted to say about tobago um or anything else so yeah yeah anyone listening definitely come out to tobago next year i i'm pretty confident it's gonna sell out like right away we had 40 people last time we're trying to get 70 this time and uh i still think it's gonna sell out so once it's announced definitely get on that because you'll have the trip of your life and i never um i never try to sell anything that i don't believe in ever because i would feel so awful like taking people's money and not giving them value value is so important to me so um yeah it was a great experience actually one thing i wanted to mention before we uh before we end this is like I was rolling with someone who, uh, at the camp and a lot of, a lot of people have bought the theory course, but this guy, he, uh, he bought the theory course and while we were rolling, um, he, he was like saying things from the theory course, um, that, that he was doing and I was doing, and it was like super like cool to like see it kind of happen in like real time. So like he was like inside position, he was like, uh, you know, like he's keeping tight and everything and, and or like, um, things like when I was passing, I was like, see, I'm keeping my feet off or your feet off me. And it was just like the whole time, just like, you know, as we're rolling, doing things within the theory course. So that was a really cool experience for me. I was like, damn, and this, this stuff is making you <laughs> way harder to roll with. Like he was pretty good. And, uh, he was just a blue belt, but it was, it was like hard because he was doing everything right. He's doing everything that uh, it's in the theory course. So just a little plug for that. You know, if anyone wants to buy that, uh, yeah. Um, there is a, yeah, the, buy it because i think the i think it's got a lot of value and uh, i've had a lot of good reviews which makes me feel really good because yeah like i said i would never want to try to sell something that i didn't believe in and uh but i believe in it because people are they give me really good feedback and saying it's like changing their whole game so yeah that's uh i guess that's my sales pitch for the camp and the and the course so yeah if you're still here we appreciate you thanks for sticking around to the end of the video if you're still here please leave a comment or fist bump and we'll see you guys next time.